In Mark chapter 13, starting in verse 32, it says, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing tonight, Lord. Lord, I pray every over every lady here, Lord. Lord, I pray that we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Lord, I pray that you use me, Lord. Speak to your people for the word for right now, Lord. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen, amen, and you can be seated. So after Michael and I were engaged, we shortly started premarital counseling, and we knew we were, if you will, crazy in love, but at the same time, we wanted to make sure we were giving ourselves tools to love each other well. And I remember during one of these sessions, we needed to list out some of our stressors. So we started so we started listing them and you guys might be expecting to hear like family dynamics whose house are we going to spend christmas at finances expectations oh not me i said i'm not getting enough sleep that was that's all i wanted was some sleep and that was Three kids, Katie, like just single Katie. Can you imagine that? Past Katie talking to current Katie and see just how that's going. Just ask Michael that no matter how much the kids would be crying, running into our room saying, mommy, mommy, I was asleep. <laughs> So when Michael finally would have enough with all the kids running around and all the chaos happening, he would say, wake up. And can I tell you, the Lord is telling us the same thing. Wake up. If we're going to be women who are leading and taking ground, we must wake up out of our slumber. Wake up out of our sleep so that we can live life on mission and flourishing being the women God has designed us to become. So tonight, I wanna speak from this headline, Awaken. I wanna ask us three questions on this idea of awaken. Before we get to how do we stay awake, how do we wake up, it's vital to understand what lulls us to sleep in the first place. It's important to answer this question because clearly Jesus is letting us know that we need to keep awake when he says this in Mark 13, 33. Be on guard, keep awake. When I think about lulling to sleep, I think about when our kids were babies, like baby babies. I remember the, dark, the room had to be dark had to have that sound machine super loud with that white noise. They had to have a full belly, and then I would rock and walk with them. I had this movement, Michael said, it was my exercise movement because I kind of got a little aggressive when I got real tired. But then you would lay them down in their crib, and if they're newborns, you would pray that they don't do these jazz hands at you and have a staring contest with you, and like, why aren't you asleep? In that same way that baby is rocked to sleep, what is rocking us to sleep? What is lulling us to sleep? Is it that sound machine, if you will? 
What is that dark thing? What are the things that distract us from the calling that God has for us? Let's take a moment to answer what lulls us to sleep. The first one, this is not an all-encompassing list. There's many things, so I'm just gonna talk about two. The first one, we talked about it previously on the panel, which was so, so good. I loved the panel. And the first one is comparison. Comparison will distract us. Comparison will cause us to create and believe false narratives. Comparison is a thief. It will rob you of your joy and give you no chance at peace. I've heard it described this way. Think about if you're running on a treadmill at the gym. It's been a while for me, but imagine you're running at the gym. Your eyes are straight ahead. You're focused on your rhythm, your breathing, your pace, your posture. But then all of a sudden, someone comes into the gym and they get on that treadmill right beside you. And you turn and you look. You're looking like, how fast are they going? What kind of pants are those? Are those on cloud shoes they're wearing? But you see the problem, my focus has moved from here to over here. Your focus has moved from what you are doing to what they are doing and what do they have. How can we fulfill calling and purpose if we are so consumed about the race others are running? I'll never fulfill my calling by constantly comparing my story. When you compare, you can't run well. You're thrown off balance. I am consumed with, the, uh, consumed with comparison of what they have versus what I have. I'm no longer grateful for things I have. Now the things that I have, they're not good enough. But who told you what you have is not good enough? Who told you that what you have is not good enough? Who told you that you are not good enough? Who told you that what God has placed in your hands is not exactly what you need today? Who told you what you have is not enough? It is enough. Just trust him and let him work. Know that your story will look different than the sister beside you. We're not supposed to be competing, but we're supposed to be complimenting. It's not a competition. We're standing shoulder to shoulder. When they're down, I'm down pulling them up. I think about people that I've prayed for just knowing they're walking through something. They don't even have to ask for prayer, because sometimes when you're in that spot, sometimes it's hard to even ask for prayer. But I tell them, just know I'm praying for you. You're not supposed to be competing, but complimenting. And let me tell you, God designed you on purpose for a purpose. We're not supposed to be clones or robots. We're uniquely made. We're not supposed to be copies of everything you see on social media. We were uniquely made. It says in Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Jesus Christ so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Are masterpieces the same? No, they're beautiful. They're one of a kind. They're unique. And that's exactly who you are in Jesus. Do not let comparison lull you to sleep. You have to keep your eyes right here, focus on the main thing. Another lullaby, if you will, that lulls us to sleep is pride. Pride does not always look like the arrogant person in the quarter thinking they're crushing it, nothing about them stinks, but pride can take on many shapes and responses. 
Pride can look like I did this all by myself. I don't need anyone. God, look what I did by myself. But pride is the mindset that I can do all by, uh, bad all by myself. And the reality is we have been doing bad all by ourselves. Pride's goal is to ultimately isolate us to the point where we don't include God or others. Listen, as much as we're independent ladies, we need to be codependent ladies. We have to push back the narrative that we are all we need. We need this vertical relationship with God. But just as you saw in our group chat, we also need this horizontal relationship with others. In James 5, 16, it it says, therefore, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other that you may be healed. We know God forgives, but right here, James is showing us the power of community. That yes, God forgives, but it's community that we can go together with like-minded ladies and be healed. This action might sound difficult to do because maybe you're thinking of a confessional. I gotta confess all these sins to these ladies, but that's not what this is talking about. But rather, two or three ladies that have you allowed around you that can encourage you, that can bring correction, yes, correction, and celebrate life. And then amazing thing is, Right here in this room, you can turn and get someone's number before you leave and create that group chat, those ladies that can pour into your life, that can pray for you. That's where healing happens. We go to God for forgiveness, but we go to community for healing. In James 4, 6, it says, but he gives us more grace That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Hear me, pride will lull us to sleep by causing you to think you're the only one walking in what you're walking in or that you're alone in this. Instead, pride will die and walk in grace that God has made available to you. Here at the Becoming Church, we do this in belong groups. You can also meet a friend or two for coffee. You can invite another family over to your house and break bread, have community. We were designed for community. We need community. Pride cannot lull us to sleep when we're together because you position yourselves to think about someone other than yourself. It's the power of community. Comparison and pride can lull us to sleep, but how do we stay awake? So the next question we're gonna look at is, how do we stay awake? And it says in verses 34 and 35 in our text, it is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the, ev- in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster call- crows, or in the morning. Look at verse 34 of what we just read. It says, when He leaves home and puts his servants in charge, that's you and I, each with his own work. That's our calling. That's our mission. This tells us we stay awake by staying on mission. It sounds good to say stay on mission, but how do we stay on mission? And when I think about mission, I think about troops going into battle, receiving their marching orders to position them to accomplish the mission. Can I tell you, we have been given our marching orders. In Matthew 28, starting in verse 19, it says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am always 
I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the great commission that Jesus was instructing the disciples and ultimately you and me. This is our mission. We are to make disciples, but the only way we can do that is to be connected to the one who gave us the instructions, and that is accomplished through prayer. Martin Luther said this, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible to be alive without breathing. In other words, it's hard to be a Christian if we don't pray. It's difficult to stay on mission if we don't pray. Ladies, what would our marriage look like if there was no talking, no communication? What would our relationships look like without communication? What would friendships look like without communication? In the same way, how can we stay on mission if there's no communication? Why? Because communication is that connector. Communication connects my heart closer to God's. It helps me to grow closer to him. It helps me to see with vision and to see what he sees. It helps me to stay awake. Going back to something James said, he said this, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Prayer is a difference maker. Prayer is an accelerator. Prayer is powerful. A Christian that isn't devoted to prayer is a Christian that lacks the power and ability to make a difference. It takes more than willpower to stay on mission. It takes prayer that contains power to empower us to stay on mission. If we're going to be earth-shaking, territory-taking women, we have to move with the mindset that says, in Huntsville as it is in heaven, in Madison as it is in heaven. Not on our watch that we're gonna watch people live disconnected from the truth of who Jesus is and the freedom that he can bring, but we can only do that when we're connected to God in prayer. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So no matter the situation, pray. No matter the moment, pray. No matter what you're going through, pray. It doesn't have to be King's English, if you will. You just open up your mouth and begin to pray. In my life, it looks like I open up my eyes and I say, thank you, Lord, for today. As I wake up the kids, Lord, I pray your protection over them. As before we leave the house, pray wisdom and the kids make good choices. On the way to work, it's like, Lord, use me, whatever that looks like today. If it's something that I think is a distraction or something that has caused like, I can't get to work on time because I gotta stop and get gas. Well, maybe I can use that as an opportunity. Lord, use me. Someone comes into the office with something. Lord, what, what do you want me to say to them? On the, when I'm at lunch, like I'm thinking about my kids, Lord, please protect them. Uh, please let them be making good uh, decisions in the lunchroom. But, but that's as simple as it is. It's just this connection to God. We miss having a prayer life because we don't realize how easy it is. The power of prayer is not realized in its complexity, but rather in its authenticity. We must stay on mission. We must stay awake by staying in Jesus, remaining in Jesus. In John 15, five, it says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is telling us to remain in him. In a day and time where everything seems to want to discover who 
they are in all these other places, Jesus is saying, remain in me. Here's some context to the imagery of the vine and branches. A single vine will support multiple branches and ultimately produce many grapes. Why? Because the vine is the source of life to those branches. The vine ensures that the branches receive the nutrients necessary to sustain life. Ladies, what is giving you life? What is sustaining you? How are you staying on mission? We can only stay on mission when we stay in Jesus. When your marriage is rocky, you stay in Jesus. When your health isn't right, you stay in Jesus. When your kids can't seem to get it together, you stay in Jesus. We stay in Jesus no matter what. Why? Because he is consistent. He is holy. He never fails. When all other areas fail, he is the source that will be consistent in the chaos. Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When you stay in Jesus, you discover peace. When you stay in Jesus, you discover hope. When you stay in Jesus, you discover freedom. So as I close, we looked at what lulls us to sleep. We looked at how to stay awake. But what happens if we have fallen to sleep? So the last question is that we're gonna look at, look at is how do we wake up? We've all fallen asleep. We've all gotten off mission. We've all turned our focus from here to over here. But if we look back at verses 36, it says, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. What happens if you have fallen asleep? What happens if we have let comparison creep in? We have pride in our heart. We've gotten off mission. Our prayer isn't what it used to be. We fell asleep. Maybe we feel like it's over. How do I come back from this? We've all been there. But I have good news that it's not over. You're not alone. You heard in the group chat tonight that we've all experienced those valleys and those mountain top moments. Hear me, Jesus is waking you up. He says, come as you are. God's grace is sufficient. What if God is not yelling, wake up, but it's this still, quiet voice whispering, Wake up, daughter. Rise, sister. Awaken. There is work to be done. There are people to tell the good news of Jesus to. We need to be ready. But what if what we feel feels right now feels a little dry? It feels a little hopeless. This reminds me of the story in Ezekiel 37 of the Valley of Dry Bones. And to give you just a little con context before we get into it, prior to coming of the Holy Spirit, the way that God would speak to his people is through a prophet. He would anoint a person to be the mouthpiece for him to his people. God would talk to the prophet and the prophet would take the word of the Lord to his people. And this is who Ezekiel is. He's the prophet. God is speaking to him in this vision where God takes them in this valley. And in the valley, there's nothing but death and decay. Everything around him feels lifeless. It's dry. There's no life. 
And this is where Israel finds itself. It is a nation split into two, and there's this prophecy of the rebirth of Israel. And you can go back to Ezekiel 36 to see that. But right here, Ezekiel is saying, God, this doesn't look like prophecy. Nothing is happening here. It's death, it's decay. It's in this moment God tells him to prophesy to the dry bones so they may live again. And as he began to prophesy to those dry bones, things began to move. Things began to change. Where once things were dry and dead, now there was life, there was breath, there was movement. There was a great army. Ladies, what is dry around you? What is lifeless around you? What is dead around you? Don't just settle for death. Don't just settle for decay. Don't settle for brokenness. But instead, begin to prophesy and declare the word of the Lord to those broken areas in your life. I encourage you, Speak life to your marriage. Speak life to your career. Speak life to your health. Speak life to your kids. Speak life in the heartbreak. Begin to prophesy. In 2016, I began praying for a miracle. And I didn't know how it was gonna happen or what was next, but I began to pray. In 2018, I saw that miracle come to pass, but in 2020, God asked me to surrender that back to him. I asked, why? And he asked me, do you trust me? So I laid it down. And since then, can I be honest, given up a little bit of hope, kind of stopped praying about that one thing. I I decided that it will never be. See, I thought that I surrendered it, that it was going to be temporary, was going to be fast. But four years later, can I tell you, still haven't seen it, and it hasn't felt fast. But I'll be honest with you, I've started acting like he'll never do it, that it's permanent. I stopped believing for it. I stopped praying about it, and I let that thing dry up. But tonight, with you, I'm waking up. I'm calling on God that I've decided that my praise will be my prophecy. And no matter if this is temporary or if it's permanent, my position will to be to praise God. That I'm praising him through a no, through a never, through in 10 years, 20 years, maybe later, (laughs) through a yes, through maybe tomorrow. But I'm praising him because my life is not my own, but it's his. What is that thing that you have given up on that you decided that God will never do? What have you let dry up. I want you to speak to those places. And as the worship team comes, I just want you to know that God is still moving. He hasn't stopped. There are some things that God wants to do right here in this room tonight that will bring life. But none of those things will precede this decision to give your life to the one who wants to give you life. The one who laid down his life so that you could have life. 
so that you could be free, so that you could walk in victory. In John 10, 10, it says, I came so that you may have life and have it to the full. He wants to give you full life. So if you're in here tonight and you're ready to surrender your life to Christ or rededicate your life to Christ, listen, he's ready. He's right here standing at the ends of the road waiting to celebrate and listen, it's simple. It's a simple yes, followed by steps of faith and trusting him every day. If that's you, would you just, with every eye closed here, just in this moment, if that's you in here tonight and you say yes, I wanna choose Jesus, or I wanna rededicate my life to Jesus. Just simply, just raise up your hand. We don't wanna do anything to embarrass you, but just raise up your hand tonight. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We see your hand. If you would just repeat after me, and if all of us could repeat this together, can we say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I repent for all you've done, all I have done wrong. I believe that you have died and rose again for me. I make you Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for changing me. I choose to trust you with every area of my life. Thank you, Lord, for waking me up. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give it up to everyone that says yes to Jesus? And like I said, God wants to do many things in here tonight. So listen, I understand there are some of us in the room that have experienced the unexpected, that have experienced loss, that has experienced pain. Can I tell you that Jesus sees you? Not only does he see you, but he knows your name. And what I wanna do right here in this moment, as the team leads us in worship, these these altars will be open and we have our prayer partners. We have two in the front and two in the back corners. Ladies, this is your moment. If you would like to receive prayer, if you want to come to the altar, or if you just wanna stand to your feet and worship. I pray this is the moment that you release to God everything that you have held in, every pain that you have felt, every disappointment, and come to the understanding that you can awaken. God has more. The best is still to come.